Coronavirus has massively disrupted the political and economic landscape of Nigeria, and this has led to widespread public apprehension as to what could be its medium and long-term effect on the people and the society. However, Nigerians are expectant, with high optimism in terms of government interventions and in managing the impact of the virus on the country. Nigerians are highly interested also in what the elected representatives of the people and indeed the political class are doing to provide leadership regarding COVID-19. Dr. Dunyo Okupe, former senior special assistant on public affairs to President Goodluck Jonathan, former spokesman to President Olusha Gombasanjo, and a former governorship aspirant, joins us now. Dr. Okupe, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Okupe. Hello, morning. Morning. How are you guys? Good, good morning. Well. It's good to see you. First, congratulations, congratulations. to you and uh, Madam. Uh, you are a living, well, uh, you are a living proof that uh, COVID-19 is not a death sentence. I will rejoice with you. you. Yes, I've read some of thank your, you. some of your, you know, uh, reports, your account of what you went through. But for the benefit of our viewers and for the uh, benefit of uh, uh, this, uh, you know, particular program, uh, could you take us through? your experience. How was it, and how do you feel now, uh, after being uh, discharged? Thank you, Ruben. Um, I was close to, I mean, I am close to some friends, you know, in my locality, and um, we suspected that, you know, one or two of our folks may be showing signs and symptoms of uh, COVID. And we organized uh, we organized the test, and the test was a bit widespread and showed that you know more than what we thought. Quite a lot more people in that group were actually uh, positive. The moment I got a wind of that, I immediately called on the local NCDC team in Ogun State, and they responded to me, and they came within 24 hours, and they organized the test for me and my family. And uh, we, the, the rest was a waiting game. Uh, we waited to, because the results had to be taken to UCH. And uh, we waited for about for three days. But UCH was under tremendous pressure, heavily overwhelmed by the uh, avalanche of uh, tests that they were receiving, by far in excess of their capacity. So results did not come in three days. Therefore, uh, the Honorable Commissioner of Health in uh, Ogun State thought we should do another test and send it to Ocean State, where we thought uh, the load would be less. But that was also wrong. But eventually, the results from UCH came five days later, and that was on the 23rd of, of April. <clears throat> and um, uh, it was positive, and the one for my wife was also positive. And we were taken in into the isolation center that very day. Uh, it was quite an experience, you know, I, I was pleasantly surprised that the facility was up to standard. I have been admitted uh, in hospitals, you know, in Nigeria and overseas, and um, this could compare fairly very well with anywhere. And uh, besides the physical uh, uh, facilities, the staff, the medical team, the management team were excellent. They did their best to ensure that we were comfortable, they responded to everything that, you know, uh, being in isolation itself is traumatic, is mentally demanding and engaging. I would like to, at this point, you know, suggest, as a doctor I know, that part of the re receiving, receiving team, when a man or a woman is coming into isolation, should be counselors, you know, people who can counsel you, you know, take you through what you're going to go through, let you understand that you're not alone in this thing, and you know, explain issues to you so that you are better prepared to face it. I have had one, you know, over and above everything, uh, the management was okay. It was just left to personal, I mean, to individuals to cope with, uh, with the infection. <clears throat> Dr. Akupe, thank you for sharing your 
your experience that you went through with us and giving us some advice in that regard. I'd like to bring something up here. Since you came out of the isolation center and recovered and rejoiced on social media, you also went ahead to share your dosage and the medication that you were given uh, in isolation on social media. Now, many medics in particular have reacted to this, calling it quite irresponsible simply because we have seen several cases of people going and overdosing on hydroxychloroquine and other drugs out of that information being put out there. Now, the WHO is saying that, or it's cautioned against recommending unproven treatments. So would you say that in hindsight, it wasn't necessarily the best idea to share your dosage and share your treatments that works for you uniquely on social media? Thank you very much. Uh, we are in a world information age. And as a medical practitioner and as a patient, you know, as a member of the society, I do not believe too much in the secrecy in management of illnesses. It is a constant practice in Nigeria that when doctors prescribe medicines to patients, no, nobody bothers to explain to you what drugs they are taking. That is wrong. No Nigerian person should take any drug from anybody without asking for the name. Because you may leave that premises and something happens to you like an abnormal reaction or in the night you develop some reaction and you can't really go back to that same hospital and where you go, they ask you what drug did you take and you don't know. Now, I'm not going to give an excuse. I, don't, you know, I just responded, not as a doctor this time, but purely from the guts, you know, as, as, you know sentimentally. I had a lot of private calls from very highly placed people and friends, you know, and also I had a, a lot of uh, re requests on social media that Dr. Fine will rejoice with you, but what drugs were you placed on? So I just put, you know, uh, I just put out there innocently the drugs which I was placed on and the dosages which I, I used. Of course, you know, even if it is the same drug, Dosages may differ depending on age and your size and, and uh, dispositions. So, in, by, you know, like you said, given the benefit of the hindsight, I don't think it was something right that I did. But it was just something that I responded to emotions of the people. Uh, because uh, I quite agree with you. I also had a personal experience. A niece of mine called me and said somebody called him and said, you should thank your uncle for me. You know, when I saw that uh, prescription, I ran quickly to the chemist and I bought my own drugs, you know, that was not the intention, and it is deeply regretted. Well, I mean, I think that settles it, Dr. Okupe, uh, once you have said that uh, you didn't think it was uh, right, because people were concerned, uh, considering the fact that you are a medical doctor, and that by making that prescription publicly, you could encourage self-medication, as happened in the instance that you have also cited. But it was good to hear you say that you know, uh, isolation and treatment centers, we also need the services of counselors. Uh, I guess what you yes. mean by that is that there is a mental health uh, dimension uh, to uh, the battle against uh, COVID-19. But what other recommendations would you like to make to government, both at state level and at the federal level, in terms of the national strategy that we have seen at play? Well, you know, this thing is absolutely new. It hit us mainly and majorly, let's say in February, and we're just in May. So it is it caught everybody globally unaware. And you know, people are dying if you watch television and follow updates, people die every day. Therefore, there's no way people can wait for any national protocol or strategy, you know, which is being evolved. You know, but, you know, people have to immediately handle issues as they arise. And that is why uh, treatments vary from center to center in Nigeria and globally. But I see moves being made by the NCDC. They're trying to develop a national strategy. I cannot blame them for any delay because it is, you know, because, you know, it is something that is just evolving. And you cannot develop a national strategy for a 200 million population country that is not based on knowledge or science. So, and, you know, to, to combine this and to be sure that a decision that is taken at that level is right and, you know, it is not deleterious to the lives and survival of people, it will take time. I think uh, the NCDC have impact on something already, and I'm sure within the next two months, they will come up with something which they can now share with the whole country and give leadership and direction 
of how to manage, you know, comprehensively this uh, this scourge. Well, Dr. Kupe, uh, we'll, we'll uh, be back shortly. We we'll need to take a sh short commercial break. Uh, just stay with us. The conversation will continue. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Still with us is Dr. Doyin Okupe, former senior special assistant to two Nigerian presidents, President Obasanjo and President Jonathan, a medical doctor and a COVID-19 survivor. Well, Dr. Okupe, before we went uh, uh, on break, I had asked you about what other recommendations we would have. And uh, you had talked about uh, the national strategy uh, articulated by the NCDC. But I'd like you to unpack what Nigeria has been doing so far, both at the state and the federal level. Uh, what are your thoughts on the distribution of palliatives, the school feeding program, the lockdown, the easing of the lockdown, uh, the protests by churches that uh, churches should be reopened, mosques should also be reopened, and all of that? In terms of strategy, at whatever level, what would you like to see? What's your assessment? Thank you very much. Uh... You know, I will, and this is not a psycho fancy, I wholesomely support the position of the government on this uh, COVID-19 up to, I mean, up to date. You know, because, you know, we, I, we see even have people who do not believe that this COVID-19 is for real. I called my younger sister uh, two days ago who was bereaved. And uh, because of that, she was not really in touch with what was going on. So I said, I've just been discharged from COVID-19. Then she said, I mean, uh, uh, isolation center. Then she screamed. He said, you, brother? I said, yes. Ah. He said, I thought all this thing was just a joke. It was just a government way of making money. He said, but now that you're talking about it, you, my blood. So you see, we have a problem. And she's not an illiterate. She's a principal of a school. You know, our people do not yet believe. So, you know, what the government has done so far, I think it is good. The lockdowns are neither here nor there. If people really understand the reasons for the lockdown, it will be much, much better. Government is not communicating enough. It is okay. They are briefing people on a daily basis, but the briefings are official. You know, there, there is no empathy. There is no, uh, there is no attempt to reach beyond the briefing room. There's no attempt to go and get to the hearts of the people. We are not, you know, they're trying, but we're not communicating enough. And we really need to communicate. We really need to get down. You know, communication is pure professionalism. You know, you just, you know, so we need to actually find a way and break down this communication to local levels, up to, up to local government, you know, areas where people are. Now, the issue of lockdown, you know, people perceive it as a punishment. Number one, if you don't believe that something exists, and then you are being locked in your house for weeks because of it, then you see it as a draconian action of government and, you know, more or less a punishment. And so when you are, when you are made to, to be free and when there's a relaxation, people come out like swarm of bees forgetting the basis for the lockdown. The lockdown is to ensure and give government space to be able to trace those who are in contact with the positive people, to be able to actually limit the spread and contacts among people. And if people know that it is in their own interest so to do, they don't need government, uh, they don't need guns and security agents to keep them where, where they are. So it's still a matter of communication. But I think the government is correct, but also it is difficult, it is difficult to lock down indefinitely. You know, because, you know, when we look at it, this may be a virus that will be with us for quite a while. And then we may have to just find a way to live with it. After all, the, in, 19, in 2019 alone, 100 million Nigerians caught uh, malaria and close to 300,000 people died. Almost similar figures for Lassa fever. So we're not, I mean, we're not closing shop because of that. But, you know, I admit that, that you, know, the, the, you know, the contagiousness of this vir virus is, you know, is, 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 uh, is, is, you know, is, 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 is very high. Unlike malaria, you can sleep with somebody on the same bed, you know, who has malaria, you won't get, you won't get malaria. But, but if you stay in the same room for long enough with somebody who has COVID-19, you are probably going to get it. So, you know, people should cooperate. 
And the issue of palliative, I sympathize with people. You know, you pe most of our people work on a daily basis and earn income on a daily basis. Therefore, surviving is difficult. But if you are not like hunger is not likely going to kill, you know, especially the way government is doing it now, reducing, I mean, you know, you are locked down for this, and if, you know, next day you are free to move around and all that and all that. But basically, we must understand what the government is doing, why the government is doing it, and, there's a, and the need for us to cooperate. As for school feeding program, I think it is out of place. I must be honest. I'm not being critical of anything. It is totally out of place. The money that is being used for school feeding program can be diverted to actually institutionalize good health infrastructure in the country, to build a standard world-class hospital that will not require anybody to move out of anywhere for medical treatment, just like we are all forced to do now in Nigeria, does not cost more than $150 million. Maximum, it is between $100 and $150 million. If you do one in each geopolitical zone, it's under $1 billion. So if we spend $3.6 billion, you know, you know, in, in some palliatives and in school food programs, everything is consumed. And when this is and when it is finished, it is finished. We are back to square one. We, we, we must make attempts, very serious attempts, to ensure that we seize this opportunity to establish and redirect our priorities as a people and as a nation. You know, it is not, you know, what you know what has happened in the past is not the fault of this administration, it's not the fault of the previous one. It is just a general attitude, and it's not just Nigeria. It's just the general attitude of Nigerians, I mean, and Africans, not to place emphasis on health, health development, I mean, health and health infrastructure. Because when you spend money on health, it does not really show. It's not like building a bridge or doing a dual carriage way. So that's our problem. As for the churches, I want to plead with our spiritual fathers. You know, to, you know, it is, it is, it is not, it is not necessary for us to agitate that churches should be opened. I am glad that many churches have evolved new strategies, just like we do in our private lives. I held a meeting yesterday, it was about, you know, by Zoom, you know, with people in different places, Lagos, Abuja, and, you know, Abekuta, I was in Peru. You know, we are evolving and using technology. The church also should move with modernization. This thing, there's no history in the world that shows that any pandemic any pandemic lasts forever. It, is, it has come and it is going to go. I put it in another three to four months, we'll be out of it. So let us all endure for the sake of the country. It is better to, save, uh, to stay safe than to die. And God is himself has told us to obey our leaders. You know, in whether they are wrong or right, we must we will obey first and then we complain. You know, that is why I took off uh, that uh, posting from my wall I do not wholesomely agree with everything, but if government has said do this as responsible citizens, we must comply. And I want to beg our fathers, our spiritual fathers, to please do so. It is the overall interest of everybody. Of course, the income of the church and the ministries will come down. But that is but the same thing for the larger population. People are actually not working. We have 37 million MSMEs in the country, 37 million, you know, registered. And that means, you know, you are looking at about 50 million if you look at those who are not registered. You know, that is the population of almost the population of Ghana and, and Ivory Coast. You have a whole nation of people that are not working. And their capital with which they work is about 50,000 naira. You know, that's, that's the older capital, which they have all spent during this lockdown. So after this lockdown, we are going to be in very serious trouble unless we are able to reflect you know, the capital, the trading capital of this, uh, uh, this M M MSMEs. They are the largest employers of labor. They want that, they want that move the actual economy. So let us concentrate on that, support and assist government with ways and means by which we can come out of this thing. Because, you know, like Yoruba say, Ngotowa Leinyofa, Ojo Jelo, that is what is coming after this COVID has gone is by far more problematic than the COVID itself. 
Dr. Okope, thank you very much. And like you said, I mean, it would be nice to see the virus disappearing in three to four months, but the World Health Organization and other organizations have said that this virus may become endemic, which of course we hope it doesn't, but it may. Now, at this point, I'd like to bring something up with you. Last week, we were joined on the show by Mr. Festa Sokoye, the INEC chairman on voters' education and publicity, and INEC are insisting that the elections this year in Edo and Ondo must go on. And they are saying that this is not up to the body, but this is rather because of the constitution. What is your assessment on INEC's decision to go ahead with the elections in Edo and Ondo this year? I'm 100% with them. There are constitutional provisions that must be, you know, we must find a way, if there's a way at all, and there is a way. What do we need to do the election? People will have to campaign, but you cannot campaign with crowds. You know, there are other there are people, you know, there's something we call whistleblower campaign, in which, in which place you just put together about 40 or 50 people in a room with the, with the obeying the, uh, the physical distancing, and the candidate goes there, everybody is wearing face masks, and they wash their hands and all that. He talks to them for about 30 minutes to one hour and moves to another place. You know, that, that, you know that's it. And in, you, know, you know, for voting is easy. You, are voting, you can increase the voting, voting times and make sure that the queues, you know, the queues, you know, the queues people obey the social distancing. I, you know, one way or the other, somewhere and at some point, we must pick up our lives and move on in spite of this COVID-19. I am 100% in support of INEC. Well, uh, Dr. Kukwe, we have just about a minute left, but I would like to take you back to what you said about the people believing that uh, COVID-19 is a scam. In fact, you had to post pictures of yourself and Madame at the isolation center. <laughs> so what, you've talked about communication. Do you think this is because the people also do not trust government? Yes. Yes, it's not just they don't trust government, they don't trust we elites. That's the truth. We have failed the nation, we have failed our followership, we have failed the populace. You know, we've got to rebuild trust. One young man on my Facebook wall said, Ah, Oga Cooper, show me video of you, of yourself, in, <laughs> and your wife inside the, inside the collision center. Stop taking us a Ghibli share. Me, you know, that was why I posted the pictures. You know, the pictures were funny because, you know, when my wife was taking them, it was just about three days before we left, I said, what, what are you doing? He said, just for a record, let's just do it. You know, and so it was, it was useful. You know, people have actually lost. It's not, you know, we, you know, we have failed people repeatedly. Government, you know, not worry alone. All of us. You know, government, even at the local and state level, councillors will promise to do this. When they win, they only buy new cars, even they buy jeeps, they build houses, they invite people to come and follow them, to come and open and do uh, house warming. You know, oh, somebody who didn't have a job much. last year. Well, so these you. are the issues. Thank you thank very you, much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Okupe.